So let me bring you to the other side of the world where it's very warm. Uh, the Philippines, we are an agricultural country, uh, but sad to say we are now a net rice importer, uh, importing at least 500,000 tons of rice annually. It is quite ironic and quite sad that our rice farmers have to eat imported subsidized rice because their yields uh, and the prices of their yields are controlled by traders who finance their crop production. Conventional rice, breeding, rice farming has become unprofitable given high costs of increased use of inputs, diminishing yields from poorer soils and controlled markets. Small farmers are getting more and more marginalized as agricultural lands get more concentrated in the hands of large landowners and agribusiness. However, uh, a good uh, side of the story is that there is now an increasing number of farmers who are able to dis escape the death trap of the green revolution's high yielding varieties. They have their own traditional and improved rice varieties, resource conserving technologies and practices, a dynamic knowledge base of their own sustainable agriculture and cost saving labor through community cooperation, all made possible through a farmer led network called Masipag. So this is our story. Masipag is the Farmer Scientist Partnership for Development in Agriculture. It is also a Filipino term, actually, uh, saying uh, hard work. No? So all the farmers in Masipag should be hard workers. Uh, Masipag is a network of about 600 farmers groups, NGOs, and individual uh, researchers and scientists working on sustainable agriculture, biodiversity conservation, processing, local processing and marketing, participatory guarantee systems and advocacy, all for the aim of improving farmers' lives and livelihoods, achieving food security and sovereignty and farmer empowerment. Uh, a short history of Masipag. Uh, we started in 1985 after a historic uh, conference where farmers brought their complaints uh, about the Green Revolution to, uh, to IRI. IRI was there, the Ministry of Agriculture was there, uh, the government was there, where farmers met scientists. It was the first uh, partnership uh, where uh, after not getting what they wanted to hear from the government and from IRI, uh, the farmers asked the scientists to help them breed their own rice, the rice that would not be dependent on chemicals. So that was the start of Masipag. Uh, it was, they called it genetic imperialism because IRI collected all uh, or 4,000 of the varieties, 4,000 or so of the rice varieties of farmers. And 75% of rice lands in the Philippines at that time, 20 years after the introduction of the Green Revolution, were planted to only five varieties. So, oh sorry. Slower, okay, sorry. So, <laughs> this is new technology, you see? So, <laughs> they called the high yielding varieties high response varieties. This is what you see here HRV. They're supposed to be HYV, high yielding varieties, but the farmers called them HRV because they were so dependent on chemicals. And the other sign says, seeds of slavery because changing the seeds changed the agricultural system in the third world and first in the Philippines where IRI was located uh, because these seeds demanded increasing levels of chemical inputs and ever increasing costs leading to compact infertile soils and degraded farm environments, higher incidence of pests, and pushing farmers in a downward spiral of debt and poverty. Because of course, farmers, poor as we are in the Philippines, cannot afford to buy chemical inputs, and so these have to be loaned. And loaning means that you are indebted. And one, one failure, two failures, two cropping failures, mean that you might lose your lands because farmers have uh, short, very small lands, no? less than f two hectares, and maybe uh, half to, 
two-thirds of a hectare. Farmers were also concerned by the loss of the traditional rice, more than 4,000 varieties of which had been collected by Erie and replaced with the HYVs. So now we talk about what Masipag aimed for. So recognizing that profit was and is the main motivation of the Green Revolution, the cry of Masipag from the start was people first before profit. And this message is to be taken seriously no, by the farmers uh, 27 years after the beginning of Masipag, and its goal has always been farmer empowerment in all its strategies and programs. It is farmer-led. Farmer representatives lead decision-making and implementation structures. Since all programs are implemented at the community level and farmers spread the programs, farmer to farmer. It is also consciously following the bottom-up approach and systems thinking in sharp reaction to the top-down approach and to the technological fixes that are associated with IRI and the Green Revolution. So we have in Masipag, we thank IRI <laughs> because now we have Masipag. No, without IRI, we wouldn't be here. So now we talk about Masipag farmer-led rice breeding. Uh, the Masipag project started with 47 traditional rice varieties that farmers had collected from their own communities and with funds collected from their own pockets. No? There was a project called Piso Piso Para Sa Binhi, a peso for the seeds, where they started uh, to uh, collect the seeds so that they would have their own trial farms. The seeds were planted in the first trial farm located in Nueva Ecija. After the second, oh, so uh, it was Masipag's first seed bank, which became the backup research farm that evolved as the core and model of the Masipag trial farm set up by farmers all over the country. So now in the picture here, you can see uh, the different steps in setting up the trial farm. One farmer group, uh, if they are interested to access the seeds of Masipag, they ask for a training. That way they can access the seeds freely uh, but they have to go through the meticulous process of uh, setting up a trial farm. A trial farm is maybe 600 square meters, uh, holding at least 50 kinds or 50 varieties of rice. So, uh, but at that time, uh, in 1985, it was the backup research farm. So the backup research farm uh, is engaged in C2 conservation, breeding and selection, technology, technology verification, uh, everything. No? We call this program, there are two focus programs on RISE. Uh, one is the collection, identification, multiplication, maintenance, and evaluation, which is called the CIME, uh, and farmer-led participatory RISE breeding. The rice seed aims mainly to enable the farmers to regain control of the rice seeds. That is really the, the primary goal. And their ability to maintain the biodiversity in rice and to improve the productivity of seeds through adaptability trials, because this is what the trial farm really does. Uh, it is an adaptability trial farm. Uh, they do breeding and introduction of appropriate technologies and cultural management strategies. So together with the trial farm, uh, so, community-based adaptability trial farms are managed by the farmers' groups that are network members or who access Masipag seeds and technologies. So, each trial farm has at least 50 varieties that are studied by the farmers for their agronomic characteristics for at least four cropping seasons, uh, given the location specificity of rice. No inputs are applied in the trial farm, as it is really a, a test of survival. So it is matira ang matibay, only the, the strongest survive. No inputs, neither chemicals nor organic inputs. The seeds are also given in stewardship, meaning that they are not sold but are passed along as gifts to be nurtured and passed on to others. Each community then chooses their own locally adapted selections, which we call LAS, LAS, and varieties, LAVs, after adaptability and, 
palatability or taste trials. They then manage this collection, continuously collecting, improving, selecting, and change, exchange, exchanging. During this time of the trial farm, the four seasons, they also unlearn the green revolution mindset, which is as important as the breeding itself. They because the green revolution mindset is the dependence on the chemicals. After now, after so many years, 50 years of the green revolution in the Philippines, the farmers don't anymore believe that rice can grow without chemicals. They see only one or two varieties that are available in the market that are given to them by the traders. And so, uh, to see so many kinds of rice, it opens up their eyes. You know, I saw one presentation when you said how amazing it is to see the different. So, the farmers are really amazed to see the different uh, kinds of rice. Uh, during this time also, the appreciation for the rice plant and the biodiversity of the rice fields unfolds. As the farmers get amazed by how much diversity there, there is in rice, how they can grow and yield without chemical inputs, the trial farm then becomes their school and their laboratory and is the important turning point in their experience towards sustainable agriculture. Because it is a long process. For cropping seasons, it's really a long process for farmers who have been, who have, who are used to the instant, you know, the instant mentality that you have these seeds, you grow this, this way and that way, and then you are given the, the package of fertilizers, the package of technologies. So this is where they learn to do it slowly. Let me see what is the next, oh, okay. So <laughs> that picture first. Uh, so now, uh, in 2013, how many years? We started crossbreeding in 1988, and you can see uh, that in 20, oh, but this is 2009. Uh, from in 2009, we had 1,292 selections of rice, and most of it still, still, uh, what do you call it in agronomy? Still durable still strong even after so many years. Usually in conventional breeding they say it's only five years and then they go back to their original characteristics. But here in Masipag, we have like M45. M45 is a very popular uh, variety and it grows both in, in the uplands and in the lowlands and it is still very much alive or very much strong. I'm not uh, an agricultural scientist, by the way, so uh, please bear with me. <laughs> Advanced farmers get more interested in the rice diversity, and they get trained on rice breeding. In the early years, farmers were participants. Now they were participants in the breeding because they were guided by the agricultural scientists who determined the, the breeding objectives. The objective then was to improve the local adaptation of varieties and promoting the genetic diversity. But in the last few years, this has changed as the challenges of climate change intensified and farmer breeders chose their own breeding objectives depending on their needs, particularly tolerance to drought, uh, flooding, saline soils, and to particular pests and diseases. These are in addition to the characteristics that farmers want in their rice varieties, which are, uh, these are what they want, high yielding without the use of chemical fertilizers, early maturing, uh, resistance to pests and diseases, resistance to drought, of medium height, having strong stalks, non-lodging, high tillering capacity, long panicles, more grains per panicle, long grains. So these are what they want. So farmers do the meticulous process of selection uh, through a modified bulk method, a method which is more simple and more convenient for the farmers and produce more varied selections with more sources of genes, making their bread lines more stable, durable, and broadly tolerant to pests and diseases. So uh, breeding is 
very much encouraged and those who are really interested get into it. But because the selection process is very meticulous, they do uh, recording, taking care of their, um, of their rice plants, getting them inside when it, you know, uh, when, so you know how it is, how to take care of the, of the pots of their rice plants. So uh, now we have 70 farmer breeders in Masipag who are very active. They have bred some 506 rice lines. These are now available to other farmers in addition to the more than 2,000 traditional and improved varieties in our collections. The farmer bread lines have proven to be a quality addition as they have become popular to the farmers in combating drought, flooding, salinity, and various pests and diseases. As seen in this map, there are some farmer bread lines that are tolerable or that are tolerant to both drought and flooding. A farmer was able to develop his own line, a bread line, because he was living in the, in the lake, and, or not in the lake, but near the lake. And uh, the, the planting of rice was in the delta of the lake. And uh, he uh, developed a rice a variety, a selection, which could withstand 21 days. 21 days of flooding after a great flood in the lake. Erie has only 14 days. <laughs> so, aside from the focus on rice, so you see how much, uh, how much uh, diversity uh, or the breeding has contributed to the farmers' resilience in terms of climate change. Because across the Philippines, they choose their own top lines and they are able to choose which ones to plant. And these are available to them freely through their network. Aside from the focus on rice, uh, there are similar efforts in collecting and improving traditional corn. Uh, even though it is so difficult to uh, plant the corn in time isolation because of the uh, intense uh, planting of GM corn in the Philippines, but we have also other indigenous grains as well as native chickens. The shift to organic farming is a slow one because uh, given the context of the prevailing conventional agriculture, but it is facilitated by encouraging farmers to practice this uh, diversified, we call it diversified and integrated farming systems, what was here called multi-cropping. Uh, they are also taught about or soil fertility management, ecological pest management methods, all called from indigenous practices. So we have collected indigenous practices of farmers and we have regular forums where farmers exchange these indigenous as well as their own innovations. You know? In doing this work, cooperation becomes highly valued and communities turn up, turn to the old practice of bayanihan, which means cooperation, to provide mutual, mutually farm labor and save on labor costs as well as facilitate exchange of farming experiences and build their group solidarity. Because going against the grain of conventional farming, they need their solidarity to support each other. So these are some examples of what uh, uh, they develop. Uh, compost, they also have the earthworms, uh, the enhanced microorganisms, the EMs. During this time, uh, no. <laughs> much sharing is also done across the network, not only of seeds and uh, animal genetic resources because they also exchange the chickens, the male chickens, uh, but also of farm male chickens, uh, male goats, but also of farmers' knowledge and technological, technological innovations through farmer scientist forums, where scientists help to test, validate, and upscale their innovations. So since this is, uh, so uh, we also have uh, marketing. No? 
uh, communities market their own produce locally. So we try to develop local markets instead of bringing the produce of farmers, the organic produce, to supermarkets, to malls. Uh, we encourage the farmers to develop their own uh, local markets, uh, sell their produce directly to, consum to consumers so that we feed the poor because the poor can feed the poor. Uh, we also have a participatory guarantee system. So you can see that the, the SAC uh, with our logo, uh, the Masipag Farmers Guarantee System logo, which uh, has been accepted, <laughs> our standards have been accepted by the, by the IFOAM uh, last year. Uh, and so we are the first, oh, <laughs> CAPEX wants to come back. Uh, what, where is it now? Two minutes. Okay, so we have the MFGS logo, no? Where farmers inspect, uh, evaluate, no? do the entire, uh, uh, what do you call it, the guarantee system. And farmers represent their organizations also in local agriculture, local organic agriculture councils, taking advantage of the, we have a new organic, organic agriculture law and helping to influence the direction of organic agriculture in their own area. As a result, more municipalities, more towns are now adopting the PGS, the participatory guarantee systems, developing their own standards so that their focus is not on export markets and not on big producers, but on developing their small farmers. All these local efforts, plus the visibility of the vocal farmers, uh, help to push the food security agenda at the provincial and national levels. So this, uh, the picture is organizations at work. No? They have to plan uh, how they do their bayanihan, they have to uh, develop their own organizations because uh, a developed human resource base uh, is very important in pushing through with sustainable agriculture so that it is sustainable even without Masipag. Because Masipag is a network and these farmers' organizations are autonomous at the local level. So they have to continue it even without the network. Uh, this is, uh, I wanted to show you how we do the the networking of relationships, since we are talking here about relationships and about networking, how from the household level, farmers are able to spread the message of Masipag, farmer to farmer, about farming systems. But at the community level, they do the biodiversity conservation, both of rice, crops, and animals. Uh, they do the bayanihan, they do their land struggles, uh, they do the dissemination of agricultural knowledge through training, uh, fair prices and markets for products, you know, any, everything that can be done at the community level. And these strong communities help to make for strong uh, provinces and national level advocacy. Because it is at the national level and at the, at the provincial level where we advocate for food sovereignty, that we should have control over our own agriculture systems. And that is in practice. However, uh, this is how we do advocacy at the local municipalities, towns, councils. Uh, farmers uh, advocate for organic agriculture, advocate against GMOs so that, farmer, uh, so that municipalities can pass uh, GM moratoriums on, on GMs, even if the national government uh, passes them. So last year, uh, Masipag won a landmark case in the Court of Appeals, together with Greenpeace and other groups, in stopping all the field trials of BT eggplant, no? and thereby stopping the commercialization indefinitely. So that was really a big uh, victory for us. However, the, the Philippines is a playground of GM companies. 
maybe you know that, and there are 48 transformation events that have been approved for commercialization as food and feed. The biggest imminent threat now is the commercialization of golden rice, a Trojan horse that carries 70 patents and will irreversibly affect the food chain and agriculture as we know it. The fight against golden rice is a fight for food sovereignty, a fight for the survival of small farmers and our communities. No? With golden rice, uh, we cannot freeze like the ants in yesterday, no? <laughs> can you just say, oh, there are the wasps, so we can freeze. We don't want to give the wasps, such as Monsanto and Syngenta, we don't want to give them the windows of opportunities. No? We want to carry on the struggle everywhere in practice. The farmers are at the front line of the fight against GMOs. No? Uh, so, as a last message, I hope that in our conference, we are talking, since we are talking about relationships, about networking, we would be able to reach out and create new networks, new relationships, because the message of this conference is true, that we are all interconnected, and what affects one affects the other. We may be on the other side of the world, and we may be small, poor farmers, but if golden rice is pushed through, if they succeed in commercializing golden rice, that will be the beginning, the beginning of the change, the irreversible change, radical change in our entire food system of the planet. Let us not allow the corporations to control our rice and our agriculture. Yeah. And I appeal to you, please help the poor farmers in the Philippines and the rest of the poor countries in Asia. Please help us to defend our rice and our life, to take up the golden rice issue here in Europe, in your own countries, in your organizations, and with your governments. Thank you. <laughs>